Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is an independent podcast covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, and urban legends. If you'd like to support our show and get a bunch of extra content, plus early and ad-free episodes, sign up for our Patreon at patreon.com backslash palmahawkmedia. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K media. And be sure to check out our website at paradiseafterdark.com. Yes, on the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived episodes, our mailing list, our merch store, which we just added four new t-shirts to our merch store. Yes, yes. And you'll find links to our social medias and, of course, our Patreon, all on our website. And we also have a virtual tip jar there, so if you want to leave us a tip, we'll just give you a little shout-out on the show. Speaking of shout-outs, we have a couple tip jar shout-outs this week. Oh, yeah, you do? I've got a couple myself. Coming up first, I've got Jesse from Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you, Jesse. And I am signing in with Kelly, who's representing the 813 in Hillsborough County from Tampa. All right. I have Amy from Miami. Amy's one of our patrons. Amy, Miami. Get it? My Amy, Miami, Amy. I love Amy. it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And we have one last one here, Jeff from Brooksville, Florida. Thank you guys very Thank much. Thank you guys. Everybody that we just mentioned went to paradiseafterdark.com and left us a tip in the tip jar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, we want to remind everyone, we will be at CrimeCon in Las Vegas, April 30th through May 1st. If you're planning on attending and haven't gotten your ticket yet, use code PARADISE for 10% off. That's it. Come and see us. I'm excited to sit and talk to everyone. So tonight, Lauren, before we get involved with the case that we're going to talk about tonight, one thing I want to ask you about is just picture yourself. You know, you've always heard these stories about aliens coming here and how would you approach these aliens? And, you know, they've never seen human life before in your mind. Or let's just say you went to a different planet and you were going to engage with aliens. How would you react for the first time? I mean, there's going to be language barriers. There's going to be uh, culture bar- cultural barriers. There's a lot of different factors involved in approaching a civilization that may be – that is not used to the common man. So you have to consider these things. So what would you do? I mean how, how would you kind of react to that? I honestly have no idea. Exactly. You did not prep me with this question. No, I probably I, could have come up with an answer, but I had no idea that was coming. Well, I like to be raw and genuine. It's just something I thought about the whole time I was – going through this case and researching and looking stuff up and it's I like, can see how you would make that connection. In my mind I'm thinking to myself, everyone would approach an alien differently. You hear these stories like, oh, we come in peace. Well you can say that, but what if they don't understand what you're saying? What if they don't know what your intention is? I mean, if you're an alien and you're being approached by someone, so let's just say an alien were to come to you and they're coming up to you you can't just assume that they're there for good intention, right? So therefore, you're going to be on the defensive. So with that being said, maybe we should just get into this case and then everyone can kind of answer that question, maybe via email or via social media. What question you want them to answer? How, how would, you would you approach, approach an, alien? an alien? Or how would you react if an alien were to approach you? So in other words, how would you engage hypothetically, cultu- hypothetically into a cultural difference? Because this gentleman that we're going to talk about tonight, John Allen Chow, he kind of faced this. and In a way, yeah. Let's talk about it tonight. Okay, so as Ken just mentioned, we are going to be talking about the case of John Allen Chow. Now, John Allen Chow was born December 18th, 1991 in Alabama, the third and youngest child of Linda Adams Chow, an attorney and organizer for Chai Alpha, and Patrick Chow, a Chinese-American psychiatrist who left China during the Cultural Revolution. When John was very young, the family moved and he was raised in Vancouver, Washington. As a child, he was consumed by two passions that became increasingly intertwined, outdoor adventure and Jesus Christ. As just mentioned, John's mother, Linda, was an organizer for Chai Alpha. Chai Alpha is an international and interdenominational university student society and young adult Christian fellowship sponsored by the Assemblies of God through Chai Alpha campus ministries and local churches. 
John's family was obviously Christian and were members of the Assemblies of God, an international Pentecostal church whose members sometimes speak in tongues. He attended Vancouver Christian High School, a close-knit school with just 90 students across seven grades. That is a very small school. John was a good student and sometimes described as an overachiever. Like me. He threw himself into clubs, charities, and extracurriculars. In the Royal Rangers, a Pentecostal scouting organization, he achieved the Gold Medal of Achievement, a rank equivalent to Eagle Scout, and one of the medal's requirements is reading and listening to the entire Bible. He later attended Oral Roberts University in Oklahoma and participated in missionary trips to Mexico, Iraq, Kurdistan, and South Africa. At Oral Roberts, John was even more completely immersed in evangelical culture than ever before. The conservative university forbids smoking, drinking, swearing, and any kind of sexual relations outside heterosexual marriage. Which is why I have a regular job and do a podcast. He first traveled to the Andaman Islands in 2015 and 2016 as part of his missionary trips. In an interview with the Outbound Collective in 2015, John said, Growing up, I remember dusting off a massive book in my dad's downstairs study titled Robinson Crusoe. After struggling my way to read it with early elementary school English, I started reading easier kid-friendly books like Hatchet, My Side of the Mountain, The Sign of the Beaver, and the latter of which inspired my brother and I to paint our faces with wild blackberry juice and tramp through our backyards with bows and spears we created out of sticks. Since then, the outdoors have been my home. He loved survival stories like Hatchet, Gary Paulson's gritty young adult novel about a boy forced to live off the land after crash landing in the Alaskan wilderness. He came to count as heroes the naturalist John Muir, the explorer missionary David Livingstone, and Bruce Olson, famous in the missionary community for converting the Bari people of South America to Christianity. Well, as Lauren mentioned earlier, John had visited the Andaman Islands in 2015 and 2016 as part of his missionary trips. Now, located in the Andaman Islands is North Sentinel Island. This is where John would ultimately lose his life. That's where this story takes us to. It seems inevitable that John Chow's personality... God-fearing, outdoors-loving, and obsessed with pushing himself to the extremes, would be attracted to being a missionary. Now, he first read about the Sintonese during high school, according to the New York Times, on a missionary database called the Joshua Project. In 2017, during the year when Chow participated in boot camp missionary training by the Kansas City-based evangelical organization All Nations, Chow reportedly expressed his interest in preaching to the Sentinelese which is at this point has been unheard of because the Sentinelese, also known as the Sentinelli and the North Sentinel Islanders, are a tribe of indigenous people who inhabit North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal in the northeastern Indian Ocean. Now, according to Survival International, the Sentinelese are the most isolated tribe in the world and have captured the imagination of millions, including John Chow. Now, they continue to resist all contact with the outsiders, attacking anyone who comes near. This is what I was explaining earlier in my question, was if you approached these people, how would they react? Well, these people react out of fear, so they react in a violent way, attacking these people. And in 2006, two Indian fishermen who had moored their boat near the North Sentinel to sleep after poaching in the waters around the island were killed when their boat broke loose and drifted onto the shore. Now, their bodies were placed on bamboo stakes. Now, the tribe made it clear that they do not want contact, which seems to be a choice. Neighboring tribes were wiped out after the British colonized their island, and they lack immunity to common diseases like flu, measles, anything in which would decimate their population. So you can just imagine their fear of other people. So they're not reacting out of hate. They're just reacting out of fear, and they want to protect themselves. So most of what is known about the Sentinelese has been gathered by viewing them from boats moored more than an arrow's distance from the shore 
and a few brief periods where the Sentinelese allowed authorities to get close enough to hand over some coconuts. Even what they call themselves is unknown. So no one even knows what they amongst themselves refer to them. Obviously, the name is just the North Sentinelese, the Sentinelli. That's just kind of given to them. They're kind of named after the island. Exactly. The Sentinelese, these guys, they hunt and gather in the forest, fish in the coastal waters. So the food source is there. I mean, it's an island. If you look on a map, you can kind of see it is very, I don't want to say isolated, but it is an island. I mean, there's no other approach. And this island is just that. You know, I mean, there's like, it's not like an island where there's other tribes living on it. This island is just this community, if you will. Now, they make their own boats. Now, these are very narrow outrigger canoes described as too narrow to fit two feet in. So these things are really small. I mean, it's just kind of a narrow boat. And these can only be used in shallow waters as they are steered with the, and propelled with a pole, like a punt. Like they just push it through. Kind of like a canoe, but like stick canoe. You're not paddling. You're just kind of pushing. Now, it is thought that the Sentinelese live in three small bands. They have two different types of houses, large communal huts with several hearths for a number of families, and more temporary shelters with no sides, which can sometimes be seen on the beach, with space for one family. Now, the women on the island wear fiber strings tied around their waist, necks, and heads. Now, the men also wear necklaces and headbands, but with a thicker waist belt. And the men carry spears, bows, arrows, your traditional your traditional native weapons if you go way back in time, so to speak. Because remember, these people have not had any interaction. Now, from what can be seen from a distance, the Sentinelese Islanders are clearly extremely healthy and thriving in marked contrast to the great Anamanese tribes to whom the British attempted to bring civilization to. Now, the, the people who are seen on the shores of the North Sentinel look proud, they look strong, they look healthy, and at one time observers have noted many children and pregnant women so they are th flourishing as a community. They're thriving, there. yeah. Exactly. So, I mean, it's not like it's not like they're failing and they're ill and they're just not able to, you know, basically live. They're, are, they're just being themselves, so to speak. During the 1970s, the Indian authorities made occasional trips to North Sentinel in an attempt to befriend the tribe. These were often on the behest of dignitaries who wanted an adventure. One of these trips, two pigs and a doll were left on the beach. The Sentinelese speared the pigs and buried them along with the doll. Such visits became more regular in the 1980s. The teams would try to land at a place out of reach of arrows and leave gifts such as coconuts, bananas, and bits of iron. Sometimes the Sentinelese appeared to make friendly gestures. At other times, they would take the gifts into the forest and then fire arrows at the contact party. In 1991, there appeared to be a breakthrough. When officials arrived in North Sentinel, the tribe gestured for them to bring gifts, and then, for the first time, approached without their weapons. They even waded into the sea toward the boat to collect more coconuts. However, this friendly contact was not to last. Although gift-dropping trips continued for some years, Encounters were not always friendly. At times, the Sentinelese aimed their arrows at the contact team, and once they attacked a wooden boat with their adzes, which is a stone axe for cutting wood, and in 1996, the regular gift drop missions stopped. In the following years, only occasional visits were made, again with mixed responses. After the tsunami in 2004, officials made two visits to check on the tribe from a distance, and the tribe seemed healthy and were not suffering in any way. They then declared that no further attempts would be made to contact the Sentinelese. And John Chow had what has been called an obsession with the tribe since he first read about them in high school. It was an obsession ever since Mr. Chow had learned in high school through a missionary website, the Joshua Project, we talked about earlier, that the North Sentinel people were perhaps the most isolated in the world. Now, he was hooked. At this point, he wants to know what's going on there. And much of what he did the rest of his short life was directed towards the mission of going to the Sentinelese in this island. This is what was reported by the New York Times. Now, being very active on social media, his Instagram account would have you believe he was young, carefree traveler. Like, he's been doing this forever. 
But on Facebook, he was fond of quoting Jim Elliott, one of five missionaries killed by a tribe in Ecuador in 1956. A mission trip to Mexico during high school was particularly formative. When he returned, he gave a short sermon to his classmates on his experience. We can't be lukewarm, he argued. We need to know how to defend our faith. Now we have a clip of that sermon we'll play for you now. Last year, I went on a mission trip to Mexico in my high school. While I was down there, I formed an accountability group with some other guys in the us. So, like, first off, why did we even go to Mexico? And then, why did we even form an accountability group? Well, we're Christians, and this changes everything. As Christians, we can't stay the same. Romans chapter 6, verse 22 tells us, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, we die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? We can't keep on living the same simple lives that we had before becoming Christians. We need to change. We can't just call ourselves Christians and then the next day just be like, yeah, you know, let's go to the party, get drunk, and get high, or whatever, get wasted, and live a lifestyle that's totally against what Christ has called us to do. We actually have to do something. In John 14, 15, Jesus tells us, if you love me, you will, you will obey what I command. And one of the commands that he gave us was in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And he says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. If we call, us, if we call ourselves Christians, we need to live our lives for him, we need to obey his commands. By our deeds and actions, people will know that we're Christians. Matthew 5, 16 tells us, In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. We either change or we don't believe. We can't stay stagnant and lukewarm. In fact, in Revelation 3.16, uh, it says, So because you are you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. We can't be like that. We can't be lukewarm. We can't stay on the same path that we had, that we had before becoming Christians. Instead, we need to totally change and be prepared to let, allow Christ to uh, move in our lives to follow Christ's calls to do. <clears throat> we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, But in your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who believes. Or ever ask you to give the reason for the hope that you have. It is to do this with gentleness and respect. We need to know how to defend our faith. When we go out in our world, there are people that will just come and oppose us, and they'll have questions, and they'll have arguments. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. We can't just come out there right after high school, get out our little nest and everything, and then be out there with our little downy wings and just be like, oh, wait, because we're in these secular colleges, colleges or maybe in Christian colleges that teach things that are against the Bible. We can't just, like, go out there unprepared. We need to know what we believe and why we believe it. One of the best ways to grow in our faith is to form an accountability group. When we got back from Mexico, my, uh, my buddies, my accountability buddies and I would sit down at lunch because we all had fifth period of lunch together. We sit down and we just like bring our Bibles and talk about everything. Biblical subjects, non biblical subjects, everything. We had not have questions, anything. And through that, we were able to debate with each other, sometimes argue with each other, sometimes just agree with each other. And through that, iron sharpens iron. Our faith grew in Christ. So, as Christians, we need to change. We can't stay the same. We actually have to do something. We either change or we don't believe. And we need to know what we believe and why we believe it. Remember 2 Corinthians 5.17, which says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That's great. Lord God, thank you uh, for allowing us all to come here together. Um, please just bless the upcoming lunch that's coming soon. Um, please just uh, let the traffic thing on I-5 be like smoothly so that when we leave here, you know, it's going back between uh, going south, uh, I five that traffic goes smoothly and flows good and everything. And uh, we just we just to stay together and be some prayer. Amen. From his social media postings, journals, and reports of friends and family members. It is clear that John had a genuine passion to evangelize people who had little or no access to the Christian gospel. 
For centuries, Christians have followed Jesus' teachings, referred to as the Great Commission, wherein he tells his followers to go and make disciples of all nations. According to an Australian news outlet, Mr. Chow made multiple unsolicited trips to North Sentinel Island over the past three years as he formulated a diluted plan to, quote, establish the kingdom of Jesus on the island. The mission that killed John Chow wasn't his first. Chow traveled frequently. He spent one summer during college at a Christian soccer academy in South Africa. After graduating in 2014, he went on a trip to Kurdistan to do outreach to refugees, as well as a trip to Israel sponsored by the Covenant Journey, an organization founded by the right-wing Christian activist Matt Staver. He did a National Outdoor Leadership School course trained as an emergency medical technician, and stayed in shape. He spent three summers at Whiskey Town National Recreation Area in California, working as a ranger and emergency nurse and living alone in a small cabin. He once almost died thanks to a, quote, gnarly bite from a rattlesnake and a subsequent platelet count of 10. Ooh. On another occasion, he and two friends got lost during a 14-day trek. To get back on course, they were forced to climb down a frozen waterfall. Now, as mentioned earlier, in 2015 and 2016, he took four trips to the Adaman Islands. He made contacts in the local Christian community, but did not visit North Sentinel. 2017, he was accepted to the boot camp run by All Nations, which was the Kansas City organization that works to see Jesus, quote, worshipped by every tongue, tribe, and nation. Now, all nations urges Christians to instill a wartime mentality and make strategic decisions in the battle we're waging against a real enemy. And according to his missionary group, All Nations, John spent years planning and training to travel, illegally, mind you, to North Sentinel Island, including a learning emergency medicine and study in linguistics and cultural anthropology. Think about that for a minute. So this is definitely a premeditated trip. Oh, yeah. He was preparing for this trip. He wanted to get there. Now, as part of his training, John was blindfolded and dropped off on a dirt road in a remote part of Kansas. So he's going through some extremes to prepare for this mission. I mean, he really wants to do this. And after a long walk in this remote area of Kansas, he found a mock village in the woods inhabited by missionaries dressed in odd thrift store clothes, pretending not to understand a word he said, and his role was to preach the gospel. The others were supposed to be physically aggressive. Some came at him with fake spears, speaking gibberish. It was part of an intensive and somewhat secretive three-week missionary training camp. And Mary Ho, the international executive leader for All Nations, said, John was one of the best participants in this experience that we have ever had. And All Nations helped John discuss the risk with him, and sent him on the mission to support him in his life's calling, she added. Mr. Chow went to share the love of Jesus, said Mary Ho. He wanted to have a long-term relationship and, if possible, to be accepted by them and live among them, she said. Now, take, in, take this into consideration. They know what he's about to do. Yes. They know where he's headed. They know it's illegal. And they know, exactly, they know it's illegal, but yet they're still... Preparing him for this. And the fact that she said the best they've ever had at this, that means that they've done this with other scenarios. So this must just be like a regular thing for them to get people to, you know what I mean? Because it's like everyone was involved in this. The, I mean, the fake community, everything. Just seems like an awful lot of effort for this one mission. Well, that year, John also attended a program at the Canada Institute of Linguistics, a missionary language school. His goal was to turn the Bible into the Sentinelese language, which nobody knows what their language is, so I don't know what that's about. But that would be amazing because the language has not been cracked and anthropologists don't know how to, it communicates or even how the language works. One night in the computer lab, John told a friend named Ben of, quote, his burden to save the Sentinelese. 
I was impressed immediately that this was something no one but God alone could relieve him of, Ben wrote. He had already heard all the arguments of why this was a fool's errand and would jeopardize any mission associated with it, let alone all the lives of the individuals involved. This was a sacred trust for him that no amount of reasoning would wrest from his grasp. In October of 2018, John embarked on what would be his last expedition to North Sentinel Island, which he considered to be Satan's last stronghold on Earth, with the aim of contacting and living among the Sentinelese and spreading the gospel of Christianity. Well, he first established his residence at Port Blair, the capital city of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, a Union territory of India in the Bay of Bengal. Now, there he prepared an initial contact kit, including picture cards for communication, gifts he was going to bring to the Sentinelese people, uh, medical equipment in case he needed it or they needed it, and several other necessities. Now, also in preparation for the trip, John was vaccinated and he did quarantine. He did not want to bring any of this bad disease, bad blood, if you will, onto the island. And then he paid two fishermen to take him close to the island. However, he did not seek permission from the Indian authorities, as Lauren said earlier, before embarking and making this trip. So this trip now under Indian law is illegal. This is not legal for him to do. They're to protect an island. I think it's funny how he quarantined, but then he got on a boat with two fishermen. True. <laughs> yeah, true. So though he knew the islanders had long violently resisted outsiders, he conducted a covert mission to the protected island. He paddled a kayak from the fishing boat to the island and attempted to communicate with the Sentinelese upon their first contact, but left the gifts and retreated when the villagers began stringing their bows. That scared me too. He later paddled back to the island and walked up to the beach this time while attempting to communicate with the natives. He ended up abandoning his kayak and swam back to the boat in a panic when a child shot an arrow at him that struck the Bible he was holding. Well, keep in mind, you got to stop and think. These are kids that are raised to protect. Right. Why did a little kid have to shoot me today? He wrote in his notes which he left with the fishermen before swimming back the next morning. A source with access to John's notebook or journal told the Indian digital outlet The News Minute that John described having brought the Sentinelese gifts, including scissors, safety pins, fish, and a football. He was confused by the mixed messages he believed the tribe was sending out, complaining that while some members were good to him, others were extremely hostile. I have been so nice to them. Why are they so angry and so aggressive? John had written. As if he didn't know already, like, what they were going to be like when you got there. Again, you don't know how to approach them, and you don't know how you're going to be approached. So I would assume that sometimes they just sit back and wait. Let's see what's going to happen here. And then sometimes... If it's a younger crowd that's there, they're going to be like, well, number one, we have to protect the children. And two, the children are going to be like, hey, I have to show who I am in this tribe as a man, even though I'm a child, and protect. So it's kind of hard when you get in these situations. It, when you reading about when you read about these people, you you get a feel for just how cool and vicious they can be all in the same. On November 16th of 2018, the date when Chow was last seen alive. He asked a fisherman to drop him off alone on the island after thinking that the Sentinelese might feel more comfortable if they did not have the foreign fishing boat nearby. So obviously he's thinking that, okay, this boat's sitting out here. I have to be careful because maybe that's what's scaring these people. That's what's causing the problem. He's trying to cover off his bases. Very smart. Now, prior to being left on the island alone, John admitted in his diary that he was scared, but it was worth it to declare Jesus to these people. Now, John Chow was killed by the tribe shortly after arriving again on the island. And he was only 27 years old. He was very young. Yep, so but they yet, killed him. He was bringing, he, he basically had planned for this whole trip the whole time. And of course, within a matter of a few days of trying to attempt to see these people and communicate with them. They he, killed him. They killed him. 
The fishermen who ferried John Chow to North Sentinel said they saw the tribesmen drag his body along the beach and bury it. The fishermen later accompanied police back to the point on the island where they believed the body was buried. Using binoculars, officers in a police boat about 400 meters from the shore saw the men armed with bows and arrows. The boat withdrew to avoid any chance of confrontation. We have more or less identified the site and the area in general, said Dipendra Pathak, the Director General of Police of the Adaman and Nicobar Islands, where North Sentinel is located. They were patrolling the beach at the same spot John was killed with weapons, he said, according to the New York Times. Had we approached, they would have attacked. This case is the strangest and toughest in my life, Mr. Pathak said. They're trying to enter into another civilization's world. The Indian authorities eventually gave up trying to recover John's body. Again, you don't know how they're going to react, and how would you react? So John shows up, and they killed him. They had no idea what he was there for. Let's take a quick break. Let's do that. So, Lauren, let's let's start by just let's talk about the aftermath of this case. Okay. Well, seven fishermen were arrested for helping John Chow reach North Sentinel Island. Indian media said the fishermen told a preacher in the main town of the Adamans, Port Blair, about the incident, and the preacher contacted Chow's family in the United States. We recently learned from an unconfirmed report that John Allen Chow was reported killed in India while reaching out to members of the Sentinelese tribe in the Adamant Islands, the family said in a post on his Instagram page. They described him as a beloved son, brother, and uncle who wore many other hats, including Christian missionary, wilderness emergency medical technician, soccer coach, and mountaineer. He loved God, life, helping those in need, and had nothing but love for the Sentinelese people, the family said. We forgive those reportedly responsible for his death. We also ask for the release of those friends he had in the Adamant Islands. You know, that's the thing, is he was such a good person, and his intent was not vicious. No, his intent was not vicious, but his intent was foolish. It was foolish, but not vicious. And I'm not trying to speak no, ill of I, the I, dead. I'm I just understand saying what you're that saying. it was very foolish. Oh, I, I, I'm going to agree to some extent. I mean, he was doing what his life's calling was. Was uh, He's a missionary. That's what his job is to do. In his mind, he must bring the word of God to these people, right? Because in his mind, he'd been taught by this all nations, from what I can see, that this was kind of the last... You know, like he had said, this is the devil's last stronghold on the world, so to speak. So the problem arose after his death because John Chow was heavily criticized by many, including Survival International. This is a human rights organization formed in 1969 that campaigns for the rights of indigenous and or the tribal peoples and uncontacted peoples for attempting to make contact with the Sentinelese because of the risk of him introducing pathogens to the tribe – which could have been deadly since it was likely that the natives had not been exposed previously to diseases from outside the island. Now, this one, I keep hearing that in a lot of the stuff that I listened to, read, anything that I found on this, it seemed like that was one of the things they kept introducing. I agree with that, but maybe their immune systems are better than most because they live a natural life, you know? So it's like everyone everyone was concerned that he was going to bring all these pathogens and these diseases to them. If he was disease himself. So we don't know that. And All Nations was also attacked on social media for describing Chow as a martyr. And John's father, Patrick, blamed the missionary community for instilling an extreme Christian vision within John. In an email to The Guardian, Patrick Chow, he called religion the opium of the masses. If you have anything positive to say about religion, he he said... I wish not to see or hear it. Now, he said his son's zeal was a long-standing point of contention and that they agreed not to talk about John's missionary work. 
So him and John had this discussion, obviously, because maybe he, he disagreed with some of it. He wasn't going to be down on John. Now, Patrick said he did disagree with his son about many religious matters and did not want him going to the North Sentinel, but was kind of in the dark about most of the time. He was in the dark of pretty much what was going on and what his intention was of going to this island. John is gone because the Western ideology overpowered my Confucianism influence, he said. Confucianism is an ancient Chinese belief system which focuses on the importance of personal ethics and morality. Now, Patrick blamed evangelicals, extreme Christianity, for pushing his child to a not unexpected end, and he referred with particular bitterness to the Great Commission, Jesus' injunction that Christians spread the gospel to all peoples. So this is the problem that he has. He likes the Confucianism aspect of it because it's not necessarily pushing f- to try to convert everyone. It's more of a state of mind and a feeling of well-being, whereas John felt like he had he, – he feels like John had been pushed to impress upon all these others his religious beliefs. So like Patrick Chow, Justin Graves, a pastor and a friend of John's from linguistic school – has blamed evangelical culture for enabling Chow's death. John Chow was a good man, he wrote in a Facebook post. He was a loving, passionate individual I was blessed to befriend, and the loss of his light on this earth was devastating, but it cannot be left as a mere tragedy. His death brings light a multitude of issues with evangelical views and hell-based ethics. John Middleton Ramsey, a friend of Chow's and fellow evangelical, defended his actions. His motivation was love for the Sentinelese people. He said, if you believe in heaven and hell, then what he did was the most loving thing anyone could do. He added, a lot of people have said these people obviously want to be left alone, so we should respect their wishes. Well, my ancestors were also savages that wanted to be left alone. And I'm sure glad missionaries like St. Killian and Boniface stepped up and were willing to give their lives and that I don't live in a society like that anymore. John's death on the island sparked international outrage, a heated debate about the protection of tribal communities, and at least two investigations by authorities in India. It has also prompted soul-searching in the U.S. evangelical community which has been debating whether Chow was a martyr, a fool, or was afflicted by a messiah complex. According to the American Psychological Association's definition, a messiah complex is the desire and compulsion to redeem or save others or the world. The individual may harbor the delusion of being divine. Jim Jones. God, I don't want to die... Chow scrawled in his journal while sitting in a fish in the fishing boat off the coast of the island shortly before he was killed. Who will take my place if I do? Chow's diary, which his family provided to the Washington Post, unfolds like an adventure novel he once read. He arrived in the Adamans on October 16th and paid fishermen to take him by boat at night to the island on November 14th evading the lights of patrols along the way. When the sun broke, Chow drew near the tribe. The women began looing and chattering, he wrote, and he was faced by men armed with bows and arrows. My name is John. I love you and Jesus loves you, he shouted before retreating. The second day, he kayaked to the island and tried to offer the tribe small gifts, fish, scissors, cords, and safety pins. A man in white with a crown, possibly made of flowers, shouted at him. He responded by singing worship songs and hymns, and the tribe fell silent. A juvenile fired an arrow at him, piercing his waterproof Bible. Chow fled on foot through the mangroves. Lord, is this island Satan's last stronghold where none have heard or even had a chance to hear your name, he wrote. By the third day, he became convinced he was going to die. I can understand where he's coming from there because he feels like, okay, this, I, I'm, I'm, I feel like this is happening so quickly. I'm here. I'm trying to do this, but they're not even allowing me to even speak to them. And again, regardless of the tongue that he chose to use, they're not going to understand it because I don't think they really had a language that had ever been put out in 
the communities. You know what I mean? Like even no, people, nobody knows their language. Exactly. Pro- and still today they don't know. No. Well, John Middleton Ramsey, he recalled that in 2016, Chow stayed with him in Bellingham, Washington, and that the island in the Adam and Sea was much on his mind. Chow confided that he was avoiding romantic attachments because of this particular planned mission. He knew the dangers of this place, Ramsey recalled. He didn't want any hearts to get broken should something go wrong, and he was very much aware of what he was doing. He also knew it wasn't exactly legal. Watching the sunset, and it's beautiful, crying a bit, wondering if it'll be the last sunset. He, I see. This is what John wrote in his journal. You guys might think I'm crazy in all this, he wrote to his family, but I think it's worth it to declare Jesus to the people. Again, he's talking about his mission, and that's what he felt like his life's goal was to do. I think I could be more useful alive, he wrote, but to you, God, I give all the glory of whatever happens. He asked God to forgive any of the people on the island who try to kill him, especially if they succeed. He asked the fishermen to drop him on the beach, and they returned the next day and saw the tribesmen dragging John's body. So he writes in the journal, hey, I know I might die, but God, please protect me. And if something happens, he knew he was going to die. Exactly. Please don't hold these men responsible. I think he, he feared it, but he felt like he had to get to this island and had to do it, even though he knew what the ultimate outcome was going to be according to rudders the united states sends the most christian missionaries abroad of any country although many denominations send missionaries the most visible are mormons seventy thousand per year according to the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and evangelical protestants There are many resources for those interested in going out into the world and attempting to convert someone from one religion, belief, or opinion to another, a practice which is called proselytizing. World Venture, which provides support services, training, and life insurance for missionaries, and Wycliffe, which is working to translate the Bible into every language. Databases such as People Groups, and the Joshua Project gather information on what evangelicals called unreached people groups. So these are groups of people that the missionaries have not had a chance to approach or get involved with to bring the religious beliefs to, correct? No, these are um, organizations that send missionaries and help missionaries. To unreached people groups. To unreached people groups. That's what I'm saying. So these are unreached people groups they're referring to, like the Sentinelese, and there's obviously groups across the world that missionaries are going to try to approach. Yes. Well, propagating one's religious beliefs through missionary activity is practiced by segments of the world's largest religious groups, including Islam, um, Buddhism, Christianity. Even the United Nations affirms missionaries' activities as legitimate expression of religion or belief. But how far is too far? I mean, is it a mission or the missionary who is at fault when things like this happens. So when something goes wrong, like in John's case, who's at fault here? I think it's a little bit of both. Mary Ho, the leader of all nations, the missionary group that supported John, she praised his efforts and called him a martyr. Survival International's director, Stephen Corey, said the tragedy should never have been allowed to happen the Indian authorities should have been enforcing the protection of the Sentinelese and their island for the safety of both the tribe and the outsiders. The Sentinelese have shown again and again that they want to be left alone and their wishes should be respected. The British colonial occupation of the Adamant Islands disseminated the tribes living there, wiping out thousands of tribespeople and only a fraction of the original population now survives. So the Sentinelese fear of the outsiders is very understandable. Yeah. Uncontacted tribes must have their lands properly protected. They're the most vulnerable people on the planet. Whole populations are being wiped out by violence from outsiders who steal their land and resources and by disease like the flu and measles to which they have no resistance. Tribes like the Sentinelese face catastrophe Mm -hmm unless their land is protected. I hope this tragedy acts as a wake-up call to the Indian authorities to avert another disaster 
and properly protect the lands of both the Sentinelese and other Adaman tribes from future invaders. So here the Survival International is blaming the Indian authorities for not protecting the island. Well, the, it, it, well, they are protecting it in a sense because they have made it illegal. But that's the thing is, I mean, you can make it illegal. But the problem is when you outlaw something, the only people who are going to enact it are outlaws. So was John acting? He he was fully aware that it was illegal. He was fully aware that approaching this island and anything that transpired was illegal. So therefore, does that make John an outlaw or missionary? John Chow, his heart might have been in the right place, but... You also have to think of how many others did he endanger for the sake of his mission. Exactly. That's my question. The fishermen who were arrested and probably traumatized as they watched John being murdered and buried on the beach. Mm -hmm. And the Sentinelese people who have no immunity from the common cold, although he claimed to have gotten vaccinated and isolated before his trip. There's no guarantee he didn't bring any diseases to the island. And I mean, like. My question Who can be prosecuted? Yeah, exactly. No one. Well, see, in, in, in Western world, we know who would be prosecuted. The fishermen. Because if it's illegal to go to the island, and if they assist him in going there illegally, if he is murdered in commission of a crime. Felony murder. Felony murder. Then the people that are assisting him in the crime would be would be basically convicted for felony murder, correct? Yeah, in, in the, the Western United world. States, in the but Western this, world, but this is India. Well, see, and the thing was is that you can't blame the Indian government because they have made it illegal, but you can't stop people. Well, maybe they should have people out there on little boats protecting the island. I don't think they need to. I think the Sentinelese have it covered. I think they, they have it covered. I think – here's the thing. If you read into the – Sentinelese. If you do some research on them, you'll see that for the most part, they don't come and mess with people. They just live their life. They're yeah. not aggressive until they feel like they're being approached, invaded. Um, I, because in their mind, like I said earlier, um, they they don't know. So you know, like, it just how can they? How can how are they supposed to react? You don't know how they're going to react, but how how should they react? I don't know. So in this case, did they ever – have they ever found him? No. His body's never been recovered. They've never found him. So I guess without a body, you can't have a conviction, right? Well, all they can do that's is a whole nother, a whole nother subject. I'm just saying subject. I, I'm bringing the legal aspect into this because we are in the crime community well, here. Well, we can't – We I, I am not educated enough to speak on the laws of India. Well, I'm not educated at all, so that was why I was asking <laughs> So I'm not going to speak yeah. to their laws and what can and can be done, can or can't be done, who can and can't be charged. I don't know. Well, this case is just very, very sad. Or Kate, is it a case? It's it is a case. I, it is. I'm, I'm not sure. I really enjoyed the research on it. I think it was very interesting that Lauren brought this up because it, it brings to light so much information. And it's like I, I honestly never knew there was a world think- out there. That had never been approached. Well, I, I guess they have been approached, obviously, but I'm saying that it has never been inhabited. These people are basically living in caveman times, if you will, tribal times, and they're flourishing. Yeah. So why why mess with that? This is you know, things are so complicated. You look at, you know, if you come to even in India to some extent, but the Western world where things are happening so fast, communication is so vast. Um, you know, I mean, they don't have to worry about the price of gas. They don't have to worry about the price of food. It, it's not, that's not a situation they're faced with. So why mess with that? So I I was just fascinated with the fact that this is actually, it still exists in the world today. And that's what I find amazing. So I come to my original question that I asked you early on, and I'm not asking you again, but I'm just asking our listeners, hit us up and let us know, you know, respond to the feed on this. What would you do if you were to approach a situation where basically you were going to another world and you were about to approach aliens? And how do you think those aliens would approach you? And that's kind of what this case was is John really had no idea how they were going to react to him. 
In his mind, he knew what he was going to do, and he prepared everything for it. But it wasn't what he prepared for. That's a perfect way to put it. Okay. I mean, that's just, it, it's, it, this is exactly what he was. He knew what he was bringing, but he wasn't, he didn't know what he was going to get. So with that, Lauren, I think that's going to kind of end it for tonight. Okay. Again, if you'd like to support the show, please subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com backslash Palmhawk Media. That's P-A-L-M-A-H-A-W-K Media. And be sure to check out our website for links to all of our social media, Patreon, merch store, and much, much more. And remember that on our social media, I want you to answer my question of how would you approach this situation differently? Please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening on and rate and review. This really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. Yes, because I'm two stars. Lauren is three stars. That gives us five stars total. (laughs) I'm just teasing. Thank you, everyone, for listening. To Paradise After Dark. Dark, dark, dark.